pleasure to welcome you to this first joint IAF high-level dialogue on scaling up carbon capture utilization and storage technologies. The IAF launches this initiative within the framework of the circular carbon economy in close collaboration with the Clean Energy Ministerial and the King Abdullah Petroleum Studies and Research Center. Since fossil fuels still play a significant role in the energy mix, the need for investment and financing to advance CCUS and carbon recycling to abate their emissions is widely recognized by both energy and climate ministers. Moreover, leveraging the IF platform can broaden engagement and help strengthen international mechanisms and regional strategies to accelerate CCUS investment. It's a great honor for me to host such a distinguished panel of ministers and their designates, alongside with my co-hosts in this hybrid setting today. Mr. Dan Dorner, the head of the Clean Energy Ministerial, SEM. Fahad al Aljan, the president, the new president of the King Abdullah Petroleum Research and uh, Studies and Research Center, CAPSARC. And Adam Siminski in his new role as the advisor to the CAPSARC Board of Trustees. Also, please join me in welcoming His Excellency Sheikh Mohammed bin Khalifa, the Minister of Oil of Bahrain, His Excellency Suhail al Mazuri, the Minister of Energy and Infrastructure for the United Arab Emirates, His Excellency Lars Andres Lund, the Deputy Minister of Petroleum and Energy in Norway, Alex Milward, the Director of CCUS for the UK Department of Business, Industry, and Industrial Strategy. And finally, Maria DeJulian, the Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary of International Affairs of the US Department of Energy, who is pinch hitting today for Deputy Secretary David Turk, who had to travel and is unable to join us. After the public ministerial panel, we'll turn to senior industry representatives and civil society representatives to obtain their perspectives on CCUS policy support and tools in our second session, which will be chaired by, chaired by Jared Daniels, who is the director of the Office of Strategic Engagement at the US Department of Energy. And I should add that we're grateful for the voluntary contribution and continued support that we've obtained from the US government and DOE for the IF's work on carbon management. The objective of our meeting today is to obtain a better understanding of what the IAF, the Clean Energy Ministerial, and CAPSAR can do to accelerate CCUS deployment and mutually reinforce efforts by working together across world regions. The IAF report on strategies to scale carbon capture use and storage that we released today speaks to the timeliness, the versatility, and the relevance of these technologies and the levers governments and industry stakeholders can use to seize opportunities they have to resolve pressing climate and energy policy challenges. Here are just a few points from the report. Number one, CCUS deployment must reach scale at warp speed if we're gonna have a chance to achieve commitments on global warming and climate change. Number two, CCUS capacity needs to go from 40 million tons today and reach at least 5.6 billion tons by 2050 to meet Paris climate goals. That's millions to billions. Three, only markets can bring CCUS to scale. This means urgent measures to de-risk the finance for CCUS on one hand and incentivize clustering between different actors on the other. Number four, policymakers should therefore incorporate CCUS infrastructure into large scale industrial planning, national recovery plans, ESG standards, and nationally determined contributions. Five, more research and development are required to push CCUS forward, particularly in the field of carbon use. Six, Offering investors suitable incentives and more predictability across the value chain will spur deployment and development by creating new opportunities for meeting climate change mitigation and sustainable development goals. Finally, the quest to achieve climate neutrality, for instance, by building a vibrant hydrogen economy by 2050, depends on economy-wide uptake of CCUS and international collaboration to focus on high impact areas, trade-offs and technology transfer. In short, it's time to green light CCUS, just like the oil price shock of the 1970s motivated energy efficiency policies that are mainstream today. 
in partnership with the Clean Energy Ministerial, CAPSARC, and other organizations, the IAF will continue to facilitate concrete actions stakeholders could jointly take to accelerate energy sector transformations without losing sight of market stability, energy poverty, and energy security concerns. So thank you again for joining us today. I'll now give the floor to Dan Dorner, the head of the Clean Energy Ministerial Secretariat. Dan, thanks for co-hosting and speaking today. Thank you, Joseph. Dear ministers, industry leaders, distinguished speakers and guests, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this high-level roundtable on behalf of the Clean Energy Ministerial. Let me thank the International Energy Forum, CAPSARC, Joseph, Adam, your respective teams for organizing this event with us. We really appreciate it. The SEMS community brings together the world's largest and leading countries, companies, and international experts to achieve a single mission, accelerate clean energy transitions. And its flexible approach allows our members to form clean energy work streams in line with their own priorities. And CCUS has been part of the SEMS work program and our community since the very inception of the Clean Energy Ministerial and our very first ministerial meeting. In addition, last year at our 11th Clean Energy Ministerial meeting hosted by Saudi Arabia, we worked with our host to elevate the issue of CCUS, both at the ministerial meeting and in parallel with their G20 presidency. And at our most recent ministerial meeting this year hosted by Chile, we had perhaps our most extensive and dynamic CCUS program ever. In short, it has been, is currently and shall remain an important part of our work program, including, I'm sure, at our 13th Clean Energy Ministerial Meeting, kindly hosted by the United States in 2022. The SEM CCUS Workstream is an excellent, excellent example of the SEM in action, co-led by the governments of Norway, the United States, the United Kingdom, and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and with 14 countries participating in total including the United Arab Emirates also here today. And then not to mention also a strong community of international experts on policy, regulation, financing, technology, project delivery. It's an established and effective forum working towards a broad objective of accelerating carbon capture together. Now, through practical work covering both overall strategy down to specific policy, finance, many of the other issues, including getting near and long-term investment opportunities identified. This CCUS initiative is an important part of our work stream. And also it's important to show that CCUS is seen as an important part of the world's overall clean energy toolkit, including by engagement and collaboration with other SEM work programs, such as on hydrogen and heavy industry. We're proud that the CCUS work stream is continuing and we see it as an important part of the international collaboration picture in this area. It's also part of a renewed commitment of all of our SEM members to a new, more ambitious phase of the Clean Energy Ministerial itself. And in this ambitious phase, our members have agreed that it's time to set a bold new course for the SEM, one that must target a major acceleration in clean energy deployment, consistent with achieving the goals of our members and putting the world on track to achieve clean, affordable, reliable energy for all. And in doing so, all of our members agreed and highlighted the need to supercharge three key shifts in the clean energy landscape. A shift in scale, the pace of clean energy deployment this decade must far outpace the last decade. A shift across all sectors, moving from a focus just on the power sector, although that will remain critical, so one that also evolves to incorporate every sector and cross-sectoral integration, and a shift to an inclusive whole of society approach, which must emerge that looks from the role of governments and companies all the way through to the role of consumers and citizens. So we've talked a lot about supercharging in the SEM. I'm really glad to hear Joseph talk about the need for warp speed. I think in both cases, we are absolutely agreed that we're not just talking about incremental change, but massive monumental change that is required. And the SEM CCUS initiative is both an excellent example and an excellent vehicle through which we want to help drive greater global progress to ever greater heights. In that context, and by way of this welcome and introduction from me, 
I'm really looking forward to participating in today's discussion. And thank you to everyone. Back to you. Uh, thanks, Dan. Uh, I'll now pass the floor to Adam Siminski, who's the senior advisor to the CAPSARC Board of Trustees. And I, before I do that, I also want to, to make a special welcome for the first time to an IEF event to the new CAPSARC president, Vahad Al-Ajan. Uh, welcome. It's great to see you here. We look forward to many more occasions. And Adam, the floor is yours. Thanks for being here. Uh, thank you, uh, Joe, uh, for your very kind uh, welcome and uh, congratulations uh, to you and the whole team here at the uh, International Energy Forum uh, for instituting this dialogue uh, on carbon management technologies and for publishing your new report. Uh, it's an honor to join you uh, and Dan and the distinguished guests uh, at this important roundtable. Uh, I think our presence here, and by our, I mean everybody's, uh, underscores the necessity for scaling up the technologies and solutions to emissions abatement uh, that are critical to meeting the Paris Agreement and other climate uh, goals. Uh, our focus today is on carbon capture utilization and storage, and I believe there are some general principles uh, that should guide our efforts first. Uh, achieving sustainable greenhouse gas emission reductions will require a global effort that uses a whole of economy approach to policymaking and addresses a full range of sectors and employs a full array of policy tools and new approaches. I think I've uh, made a, a couple of uh, headlines for saying you can't build a house with just a hammer. You need a really uh, full tool kit and I think that that that's gonna be part of our discussion today. Second, the circular carbon economy CCE framework represents a integrated and holistic approach towards realizing carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emission targets. And the CCE covers most of the key dimensions and challenges that must be addressed. Third point, Governments can and must play an important role to help move promising innovations into early commercialization and avoid uh, what analysts often call the valley of death, the gap between demonstration and deployment stages for new projects. So I'd like to focus my remarks uh, today on this third principle uh, and highlight the role that think tanks like CAPSARC uh, can play. Uh, and CAPSARC now under the able leadership of President Fahd Ajlan, I think, uh, will be able to help shape the policies needed to move forward. CCUS technologies seem promising in theory, but uptake has been slow uh, due to a variety of factors, including high upfront costs, uh, poorly developed markets for captured carbon dioxide, policy frameworks that provide inadequate incentives for adoption, and others. An interesting paper that was just published in Elsevier's Energy Policy Journal studied 263 CCUS projects that were undertaken between 1995 and 2018 and concluded that hazard rates or failure rates were high, that institutional and technological factors have to, must work together to deliver successful results. The authors expect that uh, gradual upscaling, increasing policy support that we're beginning to see, particularly for demonstrations of uh, viable CCUS and building markets through better carbon regulations, all of these things together will help remedy the uh, current imbalance between risk and return. Uh, the authors believe that increasing the expected payoff for CCUS so that hundreds of new projects can be brought online, as uh, Dan uh, just indicated, scaling up uh, will require co-evolution of technological innovation, supportive institutions, growing investment, and the active deployment strategies for CCUS technology. So let me finish up uh, with some thoughts on why an advisory and research think tank like CAPSAR can help. They can analyze and compare various policy interventions aimed at mitigating the high upfront cost problems of installing CCUS systems. They can identify and analyze the frictions that inhibit coordination between 
the players, power plant owners, pipeline developers, geologic storage managers, and CO2 utilization customers, and so on, concentrating on the costs and benefits of different policies, uh, and uh, hopefully easing the potential conflicts. They can examine current tax and regulatory policies designed to provide incentives for CCUS and analyze their usefulness and effectiveness. Taxes, for example, may not be the best way to achieve emissions reductions. They can investigate the possible effects of increased adoption of CCUS across different regions, since unique geographic and national circumstances are likely to play very important roles. Finally, they can model the potential impacts of different energy pathways to the management of carbon dioxide and other GHG emissions, helping to find least cost solutions that will preserve and promote economic growth while enhancing environmental stewardship, all the while focusing on solutions in all sectors, making all options available. So now I'd like to once again compliment the uh, International Energy Forum for organizing this event and return the floor to Joe. Thanks, Joe. Thanks very much, Adam. Uh, as I said in my opening remarks, we're honored to have uh, several uh, important ministers and representatives of ministries join us today. So let's uh, get started. Uh, they're, they're sort of the main attraction, I think, today. So uh, let me first recognize His Excellency Minister Sheikh Mohammed bin Khalifa of Bahrain to make remarks. Uh, Sheikh Mohammed, it's great to see you. The, the floor is yours. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, pleasure to see you and everyone. And, uh... Greetings to her, their excellencies, uh, the ministers, the distinguished panelists, and our guests. Thank you very much, IEF, for setting up this forum. Very important topic. Uh, CCUS is, of course, one of the solutions we have in the oil industry to combat the effects of climate change. Uh, now, clearly, our industry is being uh, impacted by the, a lot of the policies that are happening as we speak especially in the world of finance. Today, upstream projects are not easily funded as they were in the past. I know from experience that certain export credit agencies will not fund any upstream projects today. And hence the challenge of the industry, as we know, and as we see the oil prices creeping up, creeping up suddenly the supply challenge is going to be center stage. Now, if we don't invest, you know, access to cheap energy will be a very difficult thing. People in... Uh, in development now, primarily, energy is the number one factor when it comes to uh, you know, people trying to access development. And what we see now with the challenge of funding hydrocarbon projects, clearly that uh, energy costs have only one direction to go, which is upwards. Uh, but rather than combating uh, climate change by making it more difficult to develop hydrocarbon, going to the root challenge, which is carbon emissions themselves. And hence, CCUS is one of the solutions that potentially could solve the problem. Uh, the challenge has always been, how do you make it commercially viable? Uh, now, I think one solution was always to push for a, a high cost of emitting carbon, but that would be self-imposed. Uh, there are other solutions which the region has already begun, uh, Saudi Aramco, uh, ADNOC, QP, they've all tried carbon sequestration to enhance oil production. But the challenge is they, they might not need it. They still have uh, a lot of primary production remaining. There is no real need for secondary and tertiary CO2 injection. Uh, finding the commercial means of CCUS in the region is really a challenge to make it full scale. Pilot scale, yeah, it's already underway. One of the ways which this could work is in increasing recoverable reserves. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of the fields are now going to be uh, uh, aging fields. We are not discovering the giant fields of the past, uh, which means if we are trying to target a very high recovery rate uh, of 70%, now is the time to think about using CCUS. And one way to justify it is to link it to the economic benefit of increasing recoverable reserves. Now that could make these projects more viable in the short term. I know, for example, in the discussions we've had with Aramco, that you know, they, there is really no need for tertiary or secondary production in many of their fields. 
So the only way to justify it is perhaps uh, to um, uh, to go for um, uh, enhancing the reserves. Now, one thing I'd like to point out before I end and hand over to my other colleagues is that we should never take it for granted uh, what's being uh, suggested about targets for uh, carbon emissions, etc. And we have to always fact check. Now, I'm reminded of what happened in Paris, in COP21, 2016. Uh, you know, the Arab bloc was represented by uh, one team. And I, I recall, and I don't remember the, the exact details, but they were presented with a series of numbers, and those were presented as facts. And of course, the policy that would come out of the COP21 was based on these facts. Uh, so the team said, fine, we are ready to accept. I mean, if you don't cut back emissions by X, temperatures increase by Y. But prove to us that this is scientific fact. And they deliberated for around 10 hours. Scientists at the end said, listen, we, oh, we just gave you one end of the extreme. This is not scientific fact. And they had to bring down some of the language that came out of COP21. And one of the things I, I followed recently is uh, one of the founders of Greenpeace, I think Dr. Patrick Moore, his name is. If you haven't uh, heard him speak, I, would, I suggest look him up on YouTube. Fairly interesting. I don't know if it's believable, but it th throws doubt on some of the science behind it. Now, I'm just trying to be the devil's advocate here. Like, and don't forget, ultimately, the science have to be fact-checked. Carbon is not a toxic gas. It is actually a, a building block of life itself. If we manage the carbon content in the atmosphere, which, according to historic data today, isn't that high, not alarmingly high at least, uh, the consequence that is going to happen because of our current drive is a very expensive cost of energy. And that is the cost we're going to pay. As you, as in life, everything is a balance. We can't just focus completely on uh, trying to improve uh, carbon content in the atmosphere and forget about what ultimately happens to our cost of energy. And ultimately, that is a more important factor for the development of human beings and uh, societies around the globe. So in a nutshell, I would leave you with that uh, thought process. And uh, back to you, Joseph. Thanks very much, Your Excellency. Uh, next, I'd like to turn the floor over to His Excellency Minister Sahel al-Missouri of the UAE. Uh, we spent some time together last week at the uh, gas tech conference, uh, where hydrogen, of course, was one of the key uh, focuses. And, and of course, uh, CCUS is, is urgently needed to deploy the hydrogen economy as, as uh, forecast. So, Minister, I'll turn the floor over to you. It was great to see you again. Great to see you too, Joe. And uh, Your Highness, uh, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great uh, honor to uh, join this distinguished uh, panel and uh, discuss this important event, this important subject. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, IF and uh, CAPSARC for uh, their efforts uh, in, in publishing uh, this interesting report and uh, also, I would like to thank uh, the Clean Energy Ministerial, uh, Don and his team. They've been uh, instrumental working with all of us for years to, uh, to ensure that we are, we're paying attention and, and increasing our efforts. Ladies and gentlemen, definitely the world is, is getting together on one fact, that we need to do things faster and we need uh, to, do, uh, to, to do more. On, uh, on this uh, important subject. The, uh, for us in the United Arab Emirates, we looked at, uh, at redu reducing or managing um, carbon uh, or CO2 in a holistic way. So we looked at it as a whole economy and we came up with a strategy targeting to reduce the emission by 70% by the year 2050. And definitely one of those uh, targets are going to be more projects on the carbon capture and utilization. After a successful launch of a, a commercial scale project here in Abu Dhabi, uh, in Riyadh, where we captured around 800,000 
ton of CO2 from a steel uh, factory, uh, pressurize it and use it for the first time to, to, to replace natural gas as, a, as an injectant, as an EOR. Uh, that project have, have, have been very successful from different uh, aspects. One, it freed natural gas, which is a transit fuel uh, that we would require to, uh, to, uh, to clean up the, uh, the, the, the other more pollutant uh, fossil, fossil fuels. Uh, second, it, it also provided an opportunity for us to do more because we, we will be, uh, we are injecting much more than, uh, than the volumes that we are injecting today. The success lead us to, uh, to announce a target of 5 million ton of capturing of CO2 that is going to be, to, be, to be injected. I'll give you a perspective. What does that mean for a small country like UAE? This is like growing a forest of five, of, of five million acres. This is almost 25% of the area of the UAE by 2030. So to us, this is really exciting. This is, this is the amount of capturing of CO2 that a forest of that magnitude can do. Of course, those projects will not stop in 2030. We are very optimistic on the future. And we think like we did in the first project, after this, uh, this upscaling uh, happened, more pro we will see more projects in our country and also in our neighboring uh, countries as well. The, uh, the fact that we, we need to, to work on is, like Sheikh Mohammed said, is uh, trying to do things on a commercial sense. Because at the end of the day, someone is going to pay for, for, for an expensive uh, fuel. If we are just bringing a fuel that is, that is significantly more expensive, and we are assuming that the customers or the consumers are going to just be, be happy to pay for it, then I think we, we would be, uh, we would be uh, surprised. Uh, to, uh, to, uh, and, and that's why we need the technology to work together with us as governments. And we need to ensure that the consumers are aware of the cost of, uh, of, of, the, of the future cleaner forms of energy. The uh, UAE as well uh, is, is considering other aspects uh, other than CCUS to, uh, to, to, to reduce emission. One of, it, one of it is reducing the consumption. I mean, we tend to forget that for us in developing nations and for many of, 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 the, of the, the developing nation countries, the consumption per capita is sometimes three or four times what uh, some of the, the, the uh, uh, other countries are, are using. So definitely we need to use less of the energy. And we are putting a target in UAE to reduce that consumption by 40% by the year 2050. And if we're not successful doing that, I think uh, in other countries uh, as well, I think we will have an issue. There is a... Uh, almost 1.8 billion people will come to planet Earth and uh, they, they are expecting us to, to do much more in, in terms of the conservation of energy. If we tend to use more and more of energy, we will, have a, we will definitely have a problem. Uh, and and I, think, I think we need, as we are looking at the carbon capture and utilization, we need to look at also trying to reduce the consumption uh, as well. The, uh, the, uh, the, the other elements that is important, I think, is, uh, is also the, uh, the uh, utilization or we need the technology to use the carbon itself. Uh, I mean, without, without working on, uh, on capturing some of the CO2 from the gas-fired uh, power, power plants, we will have an issue. And we need to work with the technology providers to work on the fossil, cleaning up more of the fossil fuel through the carbon capture and utilization. And, uh, and not to just think of hydrogen, even though we are a believer in, in hydrogen, Joe and I spent uh, some time discussing it and it was the subject in, in, uh, in Gaztec uh, in, in Dubai, but Hydrogen alone, at the prices that we are seeing, will not be the solution. We need to work with 
different uh, different forms of energy as well. And we need to work with the technology companies to ensure that we are we are capturing CO2 from from the gas fire. Uh, power plant and ensuring that gas as well can be clean if we can commercialize those uh, those those projects. Uh, I will leave you here, uh, uh, gentlemen. Uh, I can speak uh, on and on about the subjects, but uh, for, this is this is something that we we believe it can be commercialized. Uh, we have done it in UAE, and uh, we are keen on working with you on more projects. Uh, on, on more enablers and hydrogen, as I mentioned, uh, we see it as as one of the the options uh, for cleaner fuels in the future, both uh, blue and uh, and hopefully soon uh, green. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Your Excellency. Uh, now let's turn to His Excellency Lars Andres Lund, the Deputy uh, Minister of Norway, for remarks. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, and Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would thank you for the opportunity to attend the first high-level roundtable on carbon management technology here in Riyadh. In a time uh, where the pandemic has become one of our greatest challenges, the climate change challenge has also become more pressing. The recent, uh, recent IPCC report reconfirms what we already knew, of course, but even strengthened in more, that climate change is intensifying. The global community must act now. We must reduce our emissions drastically if we are to meet the aims to reach global peaking of greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible and achieve a balance between man-made emissions and removals by sink in the second half of this century. As we all know, climate change knows, knows no borders and international cooperation is necessary to solve this massive challenge. In the Paris Agreement, we all agreed that accelerating, encouraging, and enabling innovation is critical for an effective long-term global response to the climate change and promoting economic growth and sustainable development. The Norwegian government is committed to develop a low emission technologies. Carbon capture and storage is a priority and we have high ambitions for hydrogen. With the knowledge we have today, widespread CCS will be necessary to achieve a balance between emissions at sinks at the lowest possible cost by the second half of this century. Norway has more than 20 years of experience with CCS and we have a strong technical community. We have built these experiences and knowledge by launching Longship, the Norwegian government's new full chain CCS project. This project will demonstrate a full chain with capture, of, with, with capture of CO2 at a cement plant and a waste to energy, then transport by ships and then storage of CO2 offshore. Transport by ships provides more flexibility than fixed pipelines and offers the possibility to tie in new volumes to existing storage infrastructure. Our hope is that this will pave the way for new projects. The Norwegian government has given priority to international cooperation on CCUS. We must actively engage within the Clean Energy Ministerial CCUS Initiative, Mission Innovation, and the Carbon Sequestration Leadership Forum. And since we are virtually in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, I would like to highlight the good partnership with, with Saudi Arabia and the US in this forum. We appreciate this cooperation very much. As we are preparing for the COP26 in Glasgow later this fall, much political focus will be on raising ambitions. On a more technical level, finalizing the negotiations on transparency and Article 6 on voluntary cooperation will be important. And I know COPSAC has done a lot of work on how CCS can fit within Article 6 regime of the Paris Agreement. It is important to recognize that CCS is still very costly and that appropriate incentives and support from government are needed at this point. In this regard, the key financing principles developed by CEM CCUS finance sector lead group is a good starting point. And we need the finance sector um, on board if we are to succeed in commercializing CCS and have a truly global, global dissemination. Inclusion of CCUS fin is financial, uh, in financial mechanisms in such as Article 6 mechanism are important in this regard. 
So ladies and gentlemen, the Paris Agreement calls for a strong priority to technology development and transfer, innovation, and new models for support. It calls for preparedness and policies with a long-term approach and a broad approach, and most importantly, collaborative approaches. We look forward to continue to work with our partners to deliver on both our international commitments to fight climate change and to lay the foundations for a sustainable economy for the future. So thank you very much for the, for, for the attention. Uh, thank you, Deputy Minister, very much. Uh, let's now turn to uh, Alex Millward, the Director of CCUS for the UK Department uh, for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Alex, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's good to meet you and thank you very much for, for having us. I thought I'd just touch a little bit on what the UK program is for those who might not be as familiar, uh, although there is a lot of publicly available information on uh, our websites uh, and we welcome uh, input in that. Um, yeah, I think we see the need for scale uh, and as such have embarked on uh, a target of storing 10 megatons per annum by the end of 2030. Uh, whether that is at the warp speed that Joe referenced at the beginning, I'll leave for you to decide, um, but we think that's uh, achievable. Um, the UK's Committee for Climate Change have subsequently prepared what we call the Carbon Budget 6 which substantially increases uh, the ambition required for CO2 storage uh, in that time frame, And we're, we're currently busy working through what that will be. But I think you can see uh, the direction of travel for CO2 abatement into the hard to, hard to abate industries uh, into our permanently and safely stored uh, stores offshore. Uh, the UK is starting with uh, highly dense industrial clusters where we can get access to a number of the emitting industries across a range of gas-fired power stations, uh, industries such as cement, steel, chemicals, uh, as well as blue hydrogen production, which similar to Saudi Arabia is part of uh, you know, our national strategy and similar to a number of countries here. Um, and you know, we certainly see enabling the blue Hydrogen is key to getting the costs down. Uh, we are starting with a pipeline strategy, so slightly different from Norway, but it's, it's wonderful from an international cooperation perspective that, that you know, across the globe, we're advancing all the technologies. Uh, from the UK, we're starting with the pipeline because we can get access to that level of concentration of CO2 and, and try and drive the costs down to get that social acceptance, uh, which is going to be essential uh, for this operating at scale. And in the UK, for anyone who's interested, uh, you know, we recently published uh, a public dialogue uh, to get the reflections. Uh, and I think in general, you know, the UK society is ready for this, um, but gives a, a certain amount of leeway regarding cost as well as safety. Uh, which I think you know, the years of experience that the globe has in other countries uh, that have been operating CCUS for a lot longer than the UK has demonstrated this can be done uh, at an acceptable cost, especially when we consider the counterfactual of what the cost of not doing this mm. is. Uh, we, you know, we've certainly seen certain cities and countries and their defence and adaptation costs are significantly higher than the cost of prevention through technologies such as carbon capture, as well as others as nuclear and wind and the likes. Um, so we are advancing on that. Uh, yeah, we have an ambition across all of hydrogen in 2030 of a, of a five gigawatt uh, production. And we recently published, again, for public uh, availability, uh, a very detailed hydrogen strategy uh, for both blue and green hydrogen as to how we intend to enable and facilitate that. Um, as we work with, uh, I mentioned society, we work with investors. Um, we are advancing the policy detail on some far-reaching elements of the program, including late-life decommissioning, uh, 
uh, of any store. Eventually, when it does get fill, you know, there is a finite amount of uh, capacity in any individual store. And, you know, what happens with their recognising that this needs to be stored permanently? So we are in advanced discussions with industry investors uh, and government as to who bears what responsibility and what risk in those scenarios. Uh, very advanced thinking. Um, as well as, uh, you know, investors telling us that they're ready and industry is ready. Uh, so we will be uh, publishing and announcing just prior to COP26 in Glasgow, uh, the first wave of those industrial clusters that I referenced that will receive uh, the government support to become operational uh, by the mid-20s. And then we will run a programme to determine which will be those industry support uh, that will come on for the 2030 timeline, uh, hopefully uh, you're using some of the shipping and non-pipeline transport, be it rail and road uh, as well. So there's an awful lot of work, uh, an advanced stage policy design, uh, as well as investment committed from UK government, uh, again, in our carbon infrastructure fund. Uh, to get a good start uh, at scale and sufficient pace to be manageable uh, and successful uh, and within the scientific timelines required for, uh, for the Paris Agreement. Alex, thanks uh, very much. Um, our final speaker today is a lifesaver, <laughs> let, me, let me just say. Uh, Maria DeJulian, who's the Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary for International Affairs at the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, I know Deputy Secretary Turk uh, very much wanted to participate today, but, but, but couldn't for some logistical reasons. So uh, we're very grateful to you, Maria, for uh, pinch hitting and presenting on his behalf and on behalf of uh, DOE. So I, I give you the floor. Thanks, Maria. Thank you. Thank you very much. Your Excellencies, friends and colleagues, the Deputy Secretary does send his deep apologies for the last minute uh, scheduling change that he had. But it is a true honor for me to join you for, for what I understand is the first IEF high level roundtable on carbon management technologies. This is an important forum at an important time. So I really want to thank you for hosting this event and together with, with SEM, which we play a large role in. And I also, Joe, wanna extend a special thanks to you in particular for your leadership for you know, adapting the IEF to advance the collective goal of net zero carbon emissions by 2050. So I really do commend you for your accomplishments and for continuing the important work of the G20's energy focus group to enhancing our shared economic recovery from the COVID pandemic, to fostering key partnerships with industry and civil society to discuss the transformative trends in clean energy and climate change. So we're really looking forward to future productive discussions under your leadership. So thank you very much. As many of the countries represented in this panel, the United States is a leader in the clean energy ministerial and its CCUS initiative. It's great to see SEM and the IEF collaborate on this topic because advancing carbon capture requires collaboration across borders and across organizations. The SEM CCUS initiative is a group of now 13 countries who have joined forces to accelerate CCUS together. Australia joined the initiative just last week. And so I really want to welcome our Australian colleagues to that effort. Investing in CCUS is a three-legged stool. Governments, industry, and the finance community all must come together for projects to happen. The SEM CCUS initiative collaborates actively with both industry and the finance sector to identify strategic CCUS hubs, to discuss future investment opportunities, and to discuss how government policies and approaches can improve to make CCUS an attractive clean energy solution for industry and the finance sector. At the Department of Energy, we are working really hard to advance the Biden-Harris administration's mission to cut emissions by 50% by 2030, which is less than a decade away, to produce 100% clean electricity by 2035, and to reach a net zero US carbon economy by 2050. This mission and the work required to achieve it is more urgent than ever before. 
Deputy Minister Lund highlighted the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Sixth Assessment Report, and therefore underscoring that we have an urgent but shrinking window of opportunity to limit the harm done to our most vulnerable climate populations. At DOE, the, the Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management's mission centers around research, development, demonstration, and deployment priorities that will pave the way for achieving net zero carbon emissions by mid-century. A few of these priorities include expanding the reach of carbon capture and storage technologies, investing in carbon dioxide removal technologies to remove carbon emissions from the atmosphere, reducing methane emissions from coal, oil, and gas production and transportation, helping to advance a clean hydrogen economy, and developing domestic sources of the critical minerals that will be required in a clean energy economy. Today, however, I will focus on what this office is doing to advance carbon capture and reliable storage. Our focus is to expand carbon capture into the natural gas space and in hard to abate industrial sectors, such as ethanol, hydrogen, cement, paper, and steel production. Earlier this year, DOE made available $75 million for R&D and feed studies for carbon capture and dedicated storage on natural gas power plants and industrial facilities. So we're leveraging work we've al we're already doing to expand the potential of CCS and CO2 conversion to focus more on deployment in these hard to abate sectors. Our secretary likes to say, deploy, deploy, deploy. And that is what we are trying to do. For the production of synthetic fuels and chemicals with CO2 as a feedstock, the sourcing of low carbon hydrogen will be critical. There is significant potential in applying carbon capture to help advance a cost effective and low carbon hydrogen economy. One of our major CCS demonstration projects is in Port Arthur, Texas. That project successfully combines carbon capture with steam methane reforming to produce hydrogen. For a single production stream, the project can capture over 90% of the CO2 for the production of clean hydrogen. The project has captured over 7 million tons of CO2 since 2013. We must also be vig vigilant of the natural gas supply chain and ensuring that we are focused on methane leakage for, the, for these hydrogen pathways to be truly clean. Carbon capture will also play an indispensable part of the decarbonization of other sectors. And we can leverage data from other investments we've made in CCUS on coal to expand the potential of carbon capture. To achieve net zero goals, we will also need carbon dioxide removal approaches to permanently remove CO2 from the accumulated pool in the atmosphere. And that's where our direct air capture initiative is playing an important role. Whether CO2 is captured from a point source or through direct air capture technologies, secure and reliable CO2 storage is critical to helping us meet our climate goals. And we have a robust R&D portfolio in the carbon storage space to improve storage and operational efficiency as well as strengthen our understanding of overall cost and de-risking strategies to reduce those costs. Building upon decades of RD and D in our carbon storage program, our goal is to broaden the availability of certified resources for geologic storage through field projects that advance characterization and certification of storage complexes in regions that have known storage capacity but also in regions where the storage resource potential is more prospective. And we're aiming to expand carbon storage demonstration so that we have more projects distributed across the US and in locations where CO2 injection deep underground is feasible today. And I'm sure Jared in the next portion will dive into some of the details on some of these plans and priorities. On policy, we are also working on policy challenges that are associated with carbon capture. In the, in 
the US through our D&D deployments supported by policies like our 45Q tax credits, we're making solid progress in driving down costs through both technology improvements and learning by doing. And importantly, while we focus on the work needed to scale these critical technologies, we must also incorporate a new way of thinking where environmental justice, equity, and workforce development are at the very center of our work. To put it in President Biden's words, we have an opportunity to build back better together. Thank you very much for including me. Thanks. Thanks very much, Maria. Um, I'm starting to get some questions uh, on the Zoom platform, and I'll encourage anybody here, <laughs> Ambassador, good to see you. Anyone here in the room that, that wants to ask a question, please feel free. But let me, let me uh, sort of combine a couple of questions. Um, one is for the minister, since we, we still have them, uh, uh, Sheikh Mohammed and Minister M Missouri. The question is, what, what will be the impact uh, on the role of the MENA region in the security of supply and, and CCUS uh, advancement? Well, uh, I, will, uh, I, will, I will answer the, uh, the second question first, which is uh, the, the, uh, as we are transitioning, it's it's very important to ensure that we have we have a security of supply uh, for the required energy sources, and uh, until until the transformation takes takes its place, uh, and and the uh, I think uh, us Bahrain and many other countries are part of the uh, of the OPEC Plus Alliance, and this group uh, is is uh, have taken. Uh, the commitment to uh, to ensure the uh, that we have adequate supply to the uh, to the world. At the same time, in our countries, we are doing as well uh, our best um, in, in in trying to address the the climate change through uh, many projects. Uh, one of them is the subject of the discussion today, which is uh, carbon capture and utilization. Both United Arab Emirates and, and Saudi Arabia and many others are looking at, at our experience as well. And hopefully we will see more projects in the Middle East uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the capturing uh, of, uh, of CO2. Renewable energy is playing as well a critical uh, role in this region. We're seeing more uh, projects and uh, we're seeing also that the prices uh, going uh, almost to free uh, when we are talking about PV solar. Uh, the prices that we, are, we, we have experienced here in UAE of, uh, of around 1.35 uh, cent per kilowatt hour is really encouraging to do more in, uh, in the front of, of renewable energy. All forms of energy are going to, to, be, uh, to be needed, uh, especially during the transition years. We need definitely to do more on greener forms of energy and we are doing uh, our uh, our best uh, as countries, but this is this is something that, as uh, His Excellency from Norway mentioned, this is we're living all in one in one uh, in one planet, and we all need to be to be responsible do, to, in doing our our parts. Okay, then uh, I'll give it an attempt from my side. As you know, the largest oil and gas reserves in the world are in our part of the world, so. I think CCUS will ultimately have to be concentrated here. Now, going forward, uh, at least for the GCC countries, gas uh, remains to be the primary source of electricity. And the future trend is definitely going to be hydrogen, but hydrogen uh, in uh, uh, electric, uh, electric turbines is still in the early stages. Once that happens, I think the trend will be that you will convert methane gas on the spot in a power station using technologies like SMR, um, steam methane reforming, and burn hydrogen. But as you know, hydrogen is uh, not yet an efficient fuel in turbines. Uh, They're mixing it gradually with natural gas, but that does not take away the carbon emissions. Now in the future, hopefully with this technology progressing, I see that power stations in the GCC, which probably uh, at least for Bahrain, uh, the largest carbon emission source uh, for us are power stations. Uh, you can convert them to zero carbon emissions by burning hydrogen. 
Uh, now, what do you do with the carbon? Well, the only way would be sequestration. The other major approach seems to be uh, using greenery, especially with the large areas of the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and I mean, the palm trees is probably one of the uh, plants that absorbs the largest amounts of CO2. But these are the future trends for the region to combat that. Now, I think everybody is now looking at the challenge of the supply issue. Uh, okay, we're calling this transition fuels, but hydrocarbons are going to be with us probably longer than we expect, which means we really need to be able to fix the fundamental problem and not just jump to uh, an alternative energy source if it doesn't exist. You know, the, uh, what, what makes oil stand out is that one barrel of oil is the equivalent of four years of human labor. This is why it's the most important commodity today. Gas comes second for energy, but it does not have the fungibility nor the transportability of oil. So there has, there has to be more uh, ways of uh, absorbing carbon from the atmosphere. The region is doing its fair share, but uh, as His Excellency the Minister reiterated, making it commercial is going to be the true challenge. Back to you, Joseph. Well, th th thanks very much. If, if, and if I could keep with the ministers and maybe expand uh, the questions here. Uh, another one is, is given the cross-cutting nature of CCUS uh, and projects, are there institutional quick wins that countries can follow? Um, I know in Bahrain that you just put the, uh, the National Oil and Gas Authority under the, the, the authority of the ministry now, and that, that could, could potentially be one way to consolidate uh, authority there, but but throwing it open to the uh, to the to the group uh, uh, to provide uh, uh, some thoughts on that. Well, I think one thing we also uh, yeah, forget to bring to the to the fray is water. Water is a very scarce resource here in the region, and the impact of climate change for us affects water. Now, Bahrain is in a unique position in that we are the only small island state in the region. Small island states are looked at differently when it comes to the combat of climate change. But we, we have a dilemma. They also consider us an oil exporter. Uh, I, they sort of don't know what to do with us. But the impact of climate change on our water resources, uh, especially groundwater, are, is the biggest cost. Overcoming that is truly going to be the biggest challenge. Now, institutionally, forums have uh, started. We've had various conferences, including this one, uh, we all have our environmental authorities with carbon targets and renewable uh, energy percentages uh, to be achieved by 2030, 2035. So institutionally, all of that is coming in. Now, where is it going to be most impactful? I already see it with financial institutions. That framework is changing as we speak. Basel, uh, the EU, uh, individual countries when it comes to their banks, more and more it's becoming challenging to fund hydrocarbon projects. So those policies are changing as we speak. We need to understand how to adapt to them because um, as I said, the headwinds on the upstream sector are increasing and prices today are edging the $80, which tells you that the supply inventory issues could be here with us for some time. We haven't had very large investments for the past five to six years. You make it more difficult to fund, you are going to get very expensive hydrocarbon prices like we, we saw in gas recently, although hopefully those, those are short-lived. But it's a reminder. We have to be very careful on how we progress this. Absolutely, we have to make sure we combat the, the effects of climate change. And as I said, in the region, people forget we are poor when it comes to water resources. And that is probably the biggest impact when it comes to rising seawater levels, less rainfall, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, I, I have a question specifically for the, uh, the Deputy Minister from Norway. I'm wondering if you can elaborate on the, the Norwegian government support measures for the Longship program or project and, and the financing tools. Uh, to facilitate it. And I'll, I'll just add that your ambassador is present with us here. So uh, I want to thank him. I recently had a chance to, to meet him. He's fairly new to, uh, to Riyadh, and it's, it's great to have both of you with us. Uh, please, the floor is yours. 
thank, thank you very much. Uh, as I said, the, the long ship, long ship project. I mean, it's a whole value chain where we start with, with the capture from from one industrial plant and also from from waste management plant and then over to transport uh, so far by ship and then by by storage uh, offshore storage outside our coastline, uh, where we also can use old uh, MTA uh, uh, old uh, reservoirs. And of course, these are these are complex uh, issues and expensive uh, issues. And at least in an early phase, um, we need state support. I mean, in, in the longer run, uh, carbon capture and storage, and especially CCUS, uh, sh should be profitable uh, as we, with, with, re with reasonably high CO2, international global CO2 prices. I mean, it should be, maybe it should, 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 uh, should be profitable in, uh, in, in the more longer run, but of course the first, uh, first value chains uh, definitely will not be profitable. The technology is still in its early phases and we need both technology development and uh, setting up our institutions and also also higher CO2 prices internationally. So at the moment, the, moment the, the, the state is taking a share and about two thirds of the cost of the long ship project will be financed uh, by the state, both because of course it is not profitable and also because because of the risk risks on the taking. Whenever you have a breakthrough technology is a large risk uh, taking and, and the state is Taking our part to to take to take a, a significant part of, of that that risk, uh, we have negotiated agreements with the business. I mean, the business will take care, of especially on the storage part, and the benefit sharing uh, where where the where where the. The the, 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 the the benefits um, up to a certain level will go to will come to the, to the companies, but of course, when it if if, we, if it becomes more profitable, the state will also have our share. I mean, to finance some of the support that we we have given to the project, but these projects, I think, for the, the first first projects has to be in a way supported by 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 the state both to to reduce the risk for the companies and also because this is still an immature technology. Thanks very much. Maybe to stay with you and maybe bring in Alex, um, uh, maybe based on the, uh, the, your experience in the North Sea, are there any lessons for the Gulf region or the, the world in general from, from your activity with the CCUS there? I think there'll be lessons uh, from the whole of the, the sort of North Sea, uh, both from the UK, Norway, the Netherlands as well, advancing storage, as you know, and Denmark, uh, advancing storage, and slightly different strategies um, on the technology front with Norway pursuing shipping initially, which will absolutely be needed uh, for the global stage, uh, uh, whereas we're starting with uh, pipeline. Uh, and again, we've got a number of highly closely uh, located uh, emitting industries so you know we, we uh, ha have an advantage of that so where that clustering does occur in other countries uh, in and around the Middle East then I think there'll be some lessons there and one of the things we've taken the UK has learned from previous um programs for carbon capture, both in sort of 2009 and 2015, which at the time the UK put a stop to, um, was to have a more sophisticated business model and investment model. Uh, so essentially, I, I talked about power. We have what's a dispatchable power agreement that will uh, only come in, in in a merit table. So once demand exceeds wind, once demand exceeds nuclear, uh, then it will come in before unabated gas. Uh, and the investors and industry seem very comfortable with that, again, all subject to the detail of what gets quoted, but as a, as a principle, they're very comfortable with that. Uh, in the industrial emitters, which I talked about, the, the refineries, the chemical plants, the cement factories, uh, we essentially have a business model which is contracts for difference, which has been very successful in our wind uh, industry. And then that will correlate back to the carbon price, uh, which, which we heard about. Uh, and then hydrogen, we're still developing, but will largely be a, a production-based business model. So I think how that all plays out, and as we go through with negotiations um, with industry to understand 
the right balance between the support, um, as we heard from Norway, required from the public sector, uh, to, uh, such that the, the the taxpayers get good value for money, um, whereas you know, the shareholders also get enough investment and enough of support to instigate uh, what they need to do. I think there'll be some significant lessons about that clustering and those business models as to how to drive down cost per ton CO2 stored and get the public-private uh, flow of money uh, to make this happen as quickly and uh, at the scale that we need uh, as the science determines. So I, I think there'll be significant lessons and, and interesting different approaches from different countries which um, you know, other countries can pick and learn from. Okay, well, I think um, I'll take this opportunity to, to thank the ministers and the other speakers uh, in this session. This will uh, now end the live streaming session.